Hi everyone, my name is Minister Barry Haggerty. Welcome to Kings, where we experience life with people, power, and purpose. Thanks for taking your time to be here with us today, either in person or online. If you happen to be a guest here today, you can text NEW to 907-357-2065 and fill out the digital connect card. And take that confirmation email that you get to the next steps desk where you'll receive a free gift. Second Kings 2, verse 1. Are you ready? Let's do it. It came to pass when the Lord is about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, please. The Lord sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away from you your master or from over you today? He said, yes, I know. Be quiet. Keep silent. Verse 4. I was going to say shut up, but it doesn't really say that. It just keeps silent. Verse 4. Then Elijah said to him, Elijah, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went on to Jericho. Sons of prophet. Verse 5 again. I know. Be quiet. Verse 6. Elijah said to him, stay here. Again, it's third time. The Lord sent me on to Jordan. He said, as the, Lord, as the Lord lives, as my soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. About 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance. And while the two of them stood by the Jordan, now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water. And it went, uh, pardon me, and it was divided this way and that. So that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. And so it was when they crossed over that Elijah said to Elijah, ask what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? And Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit come upon me, verse 10. So he said, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and his horsemen. So he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes, and he tore them into two pieces. And he took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, and he went back, and he stood by the bank of the Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen to him, and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that. Elijah crossed over, and it happened as the sons of the prophet who were to Jericho saw him. They said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elijah. And they came to meet him, and they bowed to the ground before him. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for what you did in the first service, and now what you'll do in the second I pray that you would give us living understanding, that you would have your will in your way, that you would speak in such a way that we'd be forever changed, that your word would go forth and not return void as we know that it does. You stand over it to see it perform all that you sent it forth for. We thank you for your power, for your anointing that falls even now. In the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. We do have notes for you. Just as the President of the United States of America gives the State of the Union address every year, so we have fallen into a pattern now for, I would say, at probably 20 years or so. And we're not the only church that does it. There's many churches that do it. But we'll seek the Lord for a word from the Lord for the year. And so every year, we as a congregation, as, as a part of the staff of King's Cathedral and Chapels Worldwide, 343 extensions now, look forward to Dr. Morocco getting a word from the Lord. And I, I seek the Lord for this congregation, for all the churches that we're over as well. And Dr. Morocco came with a word, and the word for 2021 is fulfilled. I want you to say that. One, two, three, fulfilled. Powerful word. 
He preached a powerful message. It's all available online. You can go and listen to that, and it'll encourage you greatly. So I've started a series starting today entitled Fulfilled. Now, the thing about being fulfilled or the thing about fulfillment is that you have to have something that can get fulfilled. You have to have a word that can be fulfilled, a dream that can be fulfilled, a vision that can be fulfilled, a hope that can be fulfilled. In fact, I will use all of those terms in these next 20-something minutes to preach to you a message entitled, Dreams Fulfilled. Dream, hope, vision, passion is another way to say it. They're all synonymous, meaning they can all mean the same thing. Let me define fulfilled. To carry out, to bring to realization, to come to fruition as a prophecy or a promise. Hmm. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, that all of the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. There's over, I, I was looking last night, many different counts on how many promises, but the, the highest one I saw was 8,360 promises in Scripture. All of the promises of God are yes and amen. The word amen means so be it, so let it be done, it's finished. It is done, it is finished, amen. That's what that means. My whole family is being saved. Amen. I'm healed and whole. Amen. So when we say amen, it's finished, it's done, it's over. So all of the promises of God, this is now in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 19 and 20, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. I mean, that's amazing. 8,300, I didn't count them. 8,360 promises. Somebody said, no, it's only 7,300, whatever. It's a lot. It's a lot of promises, and they're all yes and amen in Christ, which is profound. But there's a pre the prerequisite for fulfillment is to have a word, to have a dream, to have a vision, to have a promise. You're not going to have any fulfillment if you don't have a dream, a vision, a promise, a hope, a word. In Genesis chapter 15, and if you would go there, please, it's a powerful passage and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it, but to G Genesis 15, starting in verse 1, the word of the Lord comes to Abram. He's not Abraham yet. His name is Abram. What's his name? Yeah. Abram. He's later gets a name changed, Abraham, which means father of many. Even his name is an expression of the vision that God has for him. Because through Abraham would come the promise. But Abraham couldn't have children. He was beyond childbearing or you know, inability to have children, he was too old. You understand? His wife as well. But with God, nothing is impossible. So he's talking to God in Genesis 15, and he's saying, Lord, I don't have any heirs. And the Lord's like, you're going to have heirs. Here, come outside. And he brings him outside, and he says, go ahead and look at all the stars and see if you can count them all. And so Abram goes out there, and he looks at all the stars, he says, I, I can't count them all. And God gives him a word and a vision, really. It says, more numerable will, this, will your descendants be than the stars. Every time he went outside, I promise you, when he saw the stars, he would just be like, man, I'm going to have more descendants than all those. Wow. It was a vision. The way God works throughout Scripture, all of Scripture, this is the, in the economy of God, this is how he works. He gives a word. He gives a vision. The events take place as people walk in faith, and then he gives another word. It's word, event, word. There's a big theological German word that I can't pronounce, and I can't remember what it is. But that's how God works. He, he speaks to Moses and says, I'm going to deliver my, the children of Israel. Go. He goes off, he delivers them, they come back, he gives them another word. That's how God works. God uses vision, uses hope, uses passion, uses dreams. Joseph was a dreamer. 
Some of you have died to your dreams. Some of you have quit and thrown in the towel and you've just relegated your life to watching TV, eating dinner, going to sleep and getting up and going to work and doing it all over again five days a week and hoping that one day something's gonna change. Something's gonna change today for somebody who gets a hold of what I preach to you. You don't have to stay in the dull drums of life. You can get filled with fire, passion, zeal. You can do something to precipitate change to see a vision, to see a dream, to see a hope come to pass. So in your notes now, are you, are you contending? Are you, are you fighting? Are you pursuing a dream, a passion, a desire? Desire is one of the ways that God releases vision. A hope. That God has placed in your heart. As we shift into a season of fulfillment, here's what I do not want to have happen for you. And I declare, will not happen for me. I've already made up my mind. I want you to make up your mind today. What? That if we're going in to a season of fulfillment, for the love of God, you better have a word that you're standing on because it's going to be fulfilled. If we're going to see 2021 be the year of fulfillment or fulfilled, how many of you know you should have a hope or a dream or something you're holding to hold it on to that he can bring to pass? And I know many people that don't. They just sort of muddle through life. My people perish, says the word of God, for lack of vision. And the truth is, if you have vision and you move in it, you'll see it fulfilled. I'm going to give you principles today to help you to see the vision, to see the dream come to pass, not only for you individually in your own home, your own business, your family, but also for us as a church. Let's look at this text, and we're going to take these principles right out of this text here. Elijah had a desire. What was his desire? He wanted the double portion of the anointing, a double portion of the spirit that's upon your life. I want Elijah. And there was preparation for the fulfillment of the dream. And you and I are in preparation right now for the fulfillment of the dream. How you respond, the way that you live, what you do, the things you do in the dark when nobody will catch you. Those determine your maturity, and they do make a difference. God spoke to Elijah, and you can see this in 1 Kings 19. He he runs from Jezebel. He's freaked out. He's tired. He had this great revival, and all these prophets of Baal got smoked, and he's just... He's terrified, and he runs to the the mountain of God. And in actual fact, what theologians believe is that he came to the place where Moses was spoken to by God. And he's in that same place, and the Lord comes, not in fire, not in the wind, but in the still small voice, and says, what are you doing here? I'm alone. I'm the only one that's left. Anybody ever felt that way? I did just a few weeks ago. I'm the only one that's left. And the Lord says, no, there's 7,000 more, bro. He says, oh. He says, now get some oil. Go anoint the next king over Syria. Go anoint the next king over Israel, which is Jehu. And go anoint the next prophet in your stead, which means you're almost done. You're not done yet, but you're almost done. You're going to retire, and the young buck is going to take your place. Go anoint Elisha. So what's fascinating is that he goes out, and, and he, you never see him anointing, literally oil being poured over is a picture of the anointing, it's a picture of the Holy Spirit. He never does anything to a king in Syria. A sons of the prophet does. Another, one of his delegated prophets does that. And he never anoints Jehu. Another delegated prophet does that. But he does take this mantle. And it's not oil, it's the mantle. It's a picture of, of his identity as a man of God. It's a picture of the prophet, the office of prophet. And it was made of hair, probably lamb, lamb skin maybe. I mean, we don't know. And he takes it and he's walking by a young man to, who's farming. And he has 12 yoke of oxen and implements. And he's walking by. And as he's walking by, he throws his mantle on the young man. The young man pops up and is like, oh, Yes! I mean, it's this response. Go read it. It's amazing. And he says, let me kiss my father and mother and I'll be right back. And the prophet says, what did I do to you? And he knew what he did. He called him. 
by throwing his mantle, the picture of the power of God, picture of identity, picture of a prophet. Oh, no, you can hold on to that. And he takes a 12 yoke of oxen. It's 24 different animals, kills them all, burns the wood, and has a giant barbecue for everybody and goes into the ministry with Elijah. God spoke to Elijah to have Elisha succeed him as prophet. All real dreams come from God. Please hear me. All real dreams come from God. Now, you say, well, I only have this dream in my heart. Well, how do you know it's not from God? One of the ways to know that it's not from God is if you could do it all by yourself, that would be an indication that it's not from God. That's your dream. But when God gives a dream, it always encompasses people. It always includes more people than you, a vision that's bigger than yourself. Is always the way it is. So if you don't have a vision from God, then then you're just serving yourself. So this vision is from the Lord about anointing Elijah. And Elijah has the mantle thrown on him. And what does he do? He's committed to his calling. I have seen over the 20, I think it's 22 years of pastoring, something like that. I've seen people have so much gift, so many talents and anointing and all kinds of stuff, but they cannot commit. And over the years, I've seen them come and I've seen them go, and I've seen so many tragic stories of how a young man or a young woman with favor and passion fizzles out, burns away, falls back into sin and disappears, and we don't know what happens to them. We've seen people that not commit. And we live in a culture where commitment is... I mean, how many... Uh, marriages, people throw, I fell out of love. I don't think you knew what it was. Because love has nothing to do with how you feel. I'm not feeling the love right now, so I'm going to go over here and encourage myself. Amen, pastor. How do we know what love is? That one man laid down his life for another. Love is crucifixion. Love is dying to yourself. Love, love has nothing to do with feelings. Jesus didn't want to die for you, but he was committed. He was the definition. God is actually love. And we wait for the, well, I'm just not, you know, my hair used to stand on end with warm fuzzies all over when she was around. And now I don't feel anything. It's because you're a jerk. I fell in love with him. He's just like, he just had this body, this amazing. Oh, now look at him. He's got chest of drawer disease. His chest has fallen into his drawers. And I... Commitment. You, you might have heard me say it before. If you're not committed in the military, you're going to get dishonorably discharged. If you're not committed to your business, it's probably not going to go so well. If you're not committed to your marriage, it's also not going to go so well. If you're not committed to school, you're not going to get good grades. Well, if you're not committed to your calling and what God's called you to do, why do you think that you're, it's going to come to fruition? Come on. Elijah didn't have a plan B. He had one plan, torch everything, burn it all. It's like the Spanish conquistadors, no offense to all the Spanish speakers. They would show up in a land and they'd torture all the boats and they just said to everybody, well, welcome to your new home. There's no choice of going home. You don't even have a boat anymore, you burned it. When I lost 60 to 70 pounds, I burned the boat. What does that mean? Got rid of all my clothes, which was hard to do. I had some suits, some favorite suits that were for the bigger dude. Like, oh, the suit, oh. But I knew. I just, it, it just, it's taken me three years, but I went back to being heavier. And I got, I mean, like, everything is just busting. I felt like a stinking sausage casing, for God's sake. But I gave, got rid of my, I got rid of my big clothes. And what had to happen is either I'm going shopping and get all big clothes now, or I'm going to get a hold of my flesh, I'm going to submit that thing, and I'm going back to the skinnier version of me. I'm still on the way back. But man, that was good. That Christmas and everything was good. Come on. (laughs) Sort of. He was committed. Are you committed? Are committed Are you committed to what God's called you? Are you committed to the vision? Are you committed to the dream? Are you committed to what God's called you to do? Committed. 
means you go on when other people don't want to. It means you follow through in your word. It means you get your carcass out of bed when you don't feel like it to show up. you got to be committed. He was committed. He didn't have a plan B. Committed. He was willing to serve. Look at your, look at your notes with me now. So many times people, you know, I mean, we're in ministry, but you know, we have full-time ministry here at the church, but you, know, you might have a business. Your business is ministry too. Don't, don't think of it as some secular thing that you do. Everything that we do, Priscilla and Aquila were tremendous business people. And they funded the kingdom and expanded territories and amazing. They were tent makers with Paul. Your business should be a, your calling, really. I mean, it could be a stepping stone or preparation for the next thing that God has for you. But if, if you're a plumber and you're plumbing, then do it unto the Lord, Colossians 3. And, and but come on, Smith Wigglesworth was a plumber. And then God transitioned him into a different sort of full-time ministry. But you can be an anointed plumber. You can be an anointed um, real estate person. Come on. Anointed teacher, doctor, lawyer, whatever God has called you to do, do it with all your heart as unto the Lord. Don't think of things with this, this separated mindset that this is church kingdom stuff and this is business. No, they all go together. Je- Jesus gave a parable where he said, do business till I come, occupy until I come. The word occupy is business. Stop looking at your job as a school teacher, as a principal, as an assistant principal, as a doctor, as a lawyer, whatever you're doing. Stop looking at it like it's some secular thing. Look at it as God's ordained call on your life and do it unto the Lord with all you. You say, well, I'm not ordained. Lift your hand, right? You raise your right hand. Raise your right hand all across this place online. Ready? I ordain you. There, go serve God with your hair on fire. Quit looking for a piece of paper to, to qualify the anointing in your life. I know lots of people that have more degrees than the thermometer and they got zero anointing, Amen. zero unction, zero, zero passion, zero vision, zero favor. Not here, not in, not in Kings, Alaska. Come on, somebody. You got you bought it, got to be committed and you got to serve. There was a time when Pastor Karen and I did everything. Clean toilets, vacuum, all that. And we'll do it again should we need to. you got to learn to serve. And we've had people come and say, I'm called into ministry. And what what they're really saying is, I want to preach behind your pulpit, and can you take offerings for me? And the answer is no. Get yourself a toilet brush. Get to work, and let's see how anointed you can clean the toilet. He was willing to serve. In fact, he's called the... The hand, he's called the hand washer of Elijah. Where is that water boy? Yeah, that's right. You call me a water boy if you want to. You know, I studied this out. Double portion of the spirit that's upon you. Elisha did, Elisha did seven miracles. Elisha did 14. You can call me water boy if you want. Raise the dead, heal the sick, said, water boy, that's it. Anointed water, I guess. To the degree that you're willing to serve, God will elevate you. I want you to say that. To the degree that I'm willing to serve, God will elevate me. So many people are looking for promotion without without service. That's not that way. And that can you be in the kingdom, you be faithful in little things, he makes you ruler over much. I remember we were, I don't know, I think it was a painter. I was begging God, please, I don't want to work in the world at all. I want to do this full time. And then, you know, it's funny, after we were made full time, I begged, like, why did I do this, God? God, I want to go back and painting these people. They talk back all the time, Lord. Anyway, I got healed. (laughs) Raise your hand and say hallelujah. hallelujah. I remember pleading with the Lord. And that God allowed us to go through these testings. They're, they're not fun. We just want promotion now. God, God loves you. You know, what we're in right now and what we're about to walk in, the f- fulfillment, fulfilled, moving into our new building, I wanted that 15 years ago when I first got here. Like, Lord, you can trust me with it all. Just rain it down right now. You know, some of you don't have a capacity to go to the level that you're hoping to go to. You've got to learn, to learn to be faithful in the little things. And he'll make you ruler over much, not only now, but in the age to come. Steps to fulfill your dream. Be sensitive to the voice of the Lord. 
Be what? Be sensitive to his voice. He speaks in many different ways. We just had a prophetic conference, a power conference, same thing. And we had these seasoned prophets that, that prophesied over people. And tonight, Pastor Bruno and Pastor Heather are going to flow in the Holy Ghost and preach and prophesy over some people. We're going to have some fun tonight. And that happens here without, without a guest. The gifts of the Spirit happen here through not only me and my wife, but a whole team of people. We have a company of people that can hear God's voice. You need to learn to hear his voice. You need to learn to be sensitive to his spirit. If I wasn't sent, and I'm not going to take credit for this. It's the grace of God. I was going to say, if I wasn't sensitive to the spirit, then we wouldn't have our property. <laughs> I was totally insensitive. It was everybody else, and by somehow I fell into it. But I think that's because we pray, though. Because, I mean, even, you, how many of you know your flesh can get in the way of you being promoted? So it was years ago. We were coming back from that movie, uh, The Son of God. It was in April maybe seven years ago, and my son, who at that time is 11 years old, I think, and he said, Dad, and he had said it a number of times in previous weeks, and I said, yeah, yeah, we will sometime. He said, Dad, let's go back to the old church property. Now, whether you realize it or not, the property that our new building is on, we used to own 12 years ago or whatever it is, and we sold it. We bought it for uh, 750000 and we sold it for three point five. That's that's a good investment for the church. And we purchased uh, property in Honolulu. We purchased this building and did some different things. We operate as one church in many locations. And so as time goes on, Dr. Morocco calls me and says, why don't you look at that property, Daniel? I was praying. I think you should go look at that property. So I was driving by, and I saw the number of the real estate person, and I called them on my cell phone and said, hey, you know that property, the one across from Walmart, up from Sears, Zephyrus is for sale. What's the price? Four million. I said, thanks. Bye. Hung up and said, that ain't God. No, really. I hung up and said, we ain't buying a $4 million piece of property. That ain't happening. I got faith for that now. And we're spending $23 million. Anyway, <laughs> didn't have it then. I have it now. Come on, somebody. <laughs> so, you know, we drove off and time goes by. Eight months later, come out of the Son of God, this movie that we saw. Came out, it was in April, I think. We're on the way home. It's a Monday, and I feel, I mean, really badly, I want to go home and nap, which is like, that's what I do on Mondays is my one day off. I go and I nap and rest and chill. And nobody else wants to do that. They all want to go to the property. My son Daniel's like, Dad, let's go to the old church property. I'm like, yeah, no, let's not. Like, no, yeah, let's go. And Hannah's like, yeah, Dad, let's go. I'm like, oh, gosh. Karen's like, yeah, why not? I'm like, oh. No, I want to go home and nap. And I, I remember looking back at my son. I said, how come? He goes, I don't know. I said, okay. Like, I could tell he was going to get upset or something. I mean, he was really, Im he was insistent. So I'm like, fine. <laughs> Drove up to the church property. I get out of the church property. Some of you heard the stories many times before. Others of you have never heard it. I get out of the church property. I put my foot on the ground outside of my truck, and the presence of God falls on me, and all my irritation leaves. I'm like, whoosh, whoa, Lord. Like, uh, my thought is, wow, it's like a resonant presence of God here from when we had church before. There was a building there, a barn. It was blue, all the windows blown out, F-bombs all over the thing, people sleeping in it and doing incredible debauchery, drugs. It was, it was a horrible, blown-out mess. Up to your waist in weeds. It had not been touched for 10 years and I said, well, kids, let's go in the barn. You know, I kind of look in and make sure anybody's not in there. And people were clearly sleeping in it. We walked in, and there's nobody there, so that's good news. I'm telling them, you know, where everything, all these are seats were here. It held about 100 people. Sound booth is up there. And I stand, I said, look around. I'm going to find out exactly where the pulpit was thereabouts. And I said, and the pulpit was right about here. And as I'm standing there, I'm realizing, huh, we've come a long way. And then the next thought is, we shouldn't even have a church. And I won't get into all that. The enemy hit us very hard early on when I first got here. We shouldn't exist, which it shouldn't. Things happen. The devil hit, the, hit this place. And God prevailed. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. And so I'm having that thought like, oh my gosh, you just are amazing. And so I lifted my hands and I started thanking God. Lord, thank you. And I didn't even get to finish my thought or my prayer. And he speaks to me and says, I'm giving you the property back. It was so loud, I asked the kids whether they heard it, and they said, no. But it was that loud to me. 
And I told, I told him, I said, God just spoke to me and said, I'm giving you the property back. And I remember my son says, cool, dad. And he just kicks a can. I'm like, yeah, cool. Where's your four million coming from? How, what? I mean, in fact, my immediate thought was that's totally, imp- I was going to say impossible, but I know better than, some of you need to open your mouth. Some of you need to shut it. I'm pa, some pa, 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 Lord. So I went outside and I called a real estate agent that was a part of our church. And I said, listen, I'm just here. This is what just happened. I don't know. I know it's crazy. Would you call? They called. It had just gone back to the bank. He calls me back and says, you can buy that right now for a million dollars. I said, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, oh God. I thought, oh, um, uh, I got to call Dr. Morocco. Listen, I had faith for a million. It was four. Appraised at 3.9. Listen, if you're going to see fulfillment, you're going to have to take steps of faith. You're going to have to serve. You're going to have to do your part. Some of you want to walk into miracles, but you're not willing to get out of bed and pray in the morning. So I I call. He says, only a million dollars. I said, I got to call Dr. Morocco. I call Dr. Morocco. He answers his phone miraculously. And I said, Pastor, here's what happened. And uh, my son, my son came to the thing. I called on it. They'll take a million dollars. Dr. Morocco has yelled at me three times, two of which weren't so good. This was the third one, was very good. He yells, put an offer in, put an offer in, now, put an offer. I said, okay. I hung up, called. We locked it up with an offer. We had not one nickel. We had not one nickel to buy that property. And, we, and, and the lending institution that worked with us said, we can't buy anymore because you're overextended. But when they took a look at the property, they changed all of their rules and they said, we'll lend you no money down. We'll fund the whole thing. And we made $3 million in one day. In one day, $3 million. Now, I'm going to tell you, after we did the dirt work, we got offered $9 million. It's not for sale and neither am I. We're doing something God has called us to do. We're building this thing. The gates of hell will not prevail. It will be done with shouts of grace. Grace. It will be finished with shouts of That's the truth. If you're going to see your dream, your vision, your hope come to pass, you're going to have to be committed. You're going to have to be willing to serve. you got to take steps to fulfill the dream, to fulfill the vision. Be sensitive to the voice of the Lord. And I was very reluctant. And somehow, because my whole family, listen, I'd have missed it. If it was me and my son, I'd have been like, yeah, no. Let's go later. It was the whole family wanted to go, and I'm the one that didn't. Sometimes we think we're so spiritual, and we miss the whole thing. Thank God we roll with a company of people that are full of the Holy Ghost so that when you've leaked out of your shoes and you're not full of anything but the flesh, then the Lord can help you move on into the promise. Come on, somebody say amen. Don't get sidetracked. So easy to get sidetracked. Elijah says to him, just stay here. He's like, oh, no. I'm not staying. I'm, I'm sticking with you. He sensed something was going on. There's so many opportunities to get sidetracked. I've seen people lose out with God because they go after money. And money becomes their thing. And they think like, then they, they, they're going to accrue a lot of wealth. And then they'll serve God with all their heart. Or I'm going to get this big job. And then I can drop, you know, lots of money on the building project. You know, I've, I've noticed that that never happens. I'm going to tell you, that never happens. It, it, it happens to those who are faithful in the little things with the job that they, they have and then believing God and praying and doing their part and then God elevates and then God elevates and God elevates. I've never in all of my time serving, nor have I ever heard from anyone that it, they were going to just go out, get the big thing, do the thing, and then begin to tithe. Never works. Then begin to give. It just, it just doesn't work. And I've seen people pierce themselves through, destroy their marriages, destroy their home. They waste their whole spiritual life on trying to get money. This is not about money. God has no problem. Come on, he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Your life is not about money. If your life is about money, you're worshiping what's called mammon. That's not worshiping God. There's nothing wrong with attaining wealth for the glory of God. Nothing wrong. And I believe the greatest wealth transference is yet ahead. I do believe that. I really do. And it can happen in an inconvenient time. You look at at the book of Exodus and... God says to Moses to tell the people to go plunder Egypt after the death of the firstborn. 
every home in Egypt had somebody die unless you were a Jew and you had blood on the doorposts and the lentils of your home. Every Jew and every Egyptian had someone die if you didn't have blood. It wasn't that you were just a Jew. If you were a Jew and you didn't have blood, then somebody, the firstborn would be dead, including, raise your hand if you're firstborn. You're the oldest in your family. Okay, you'd be dead. If your parents were, if, they were, if, if your mom was the firstborn in her family, she'd be gone. So understand it was a plague that ravaged all of Egypt. And then God says to him, go ask them for all the gold and silver. In Psalm 105, he brought them out with the silver and gold and there was none feeble among them. They had to actually go and knock on the door of a grieving, wailing home. And I promise you, every home is grieving and wailing. The sound of Egypt is filled with grieving and wailing. And they're to go, hello, I know it's inconvenient. But I was told by my pastor, you got some gold and stuff for me. You have gold, gems. Here's a bag. If you want to put it all in there, we're going to leave town. And uh, leave, leave already. Can I have your earrings too? I want everything if that's okay. And, And they took it and they left. What do you think they made the, 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 the ark with? They made the ark with gold that they got from, from the Egyptians. Don't get sidetracked. God has no problem fulfilling purpose and destiny, but if you don't have him in first place, then you're an idol worshiper. I don't ever want to be that. I've made a choice. I've made a decision. Have you? I have. I'm going to keep them there. I've built my life to keep them there. I preach to you to keep him there. Serve God, love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He has no problem taking care of provision for you, as we have seen with our building project. Didn't have two nickels to, to spend a million. Now we're 10 million in, and we only got half of it to go. Finances in place, but don't, don't, don't get sidetracked. Continue to be faithful and watch what God will do. That, that, that'll close, 13 million released. We'll be fully funded, finish this thing. Maybe late fall, mid, mid to late fall is my guess. We'll see. Got to work everything out with Wally, who's getting a well-needed rest for the moment in between the pause. You pray for this thing to close. Don't let your guard down. Oh, yeah, it's happened. No, it hasn't. Not yet. That's why I told you early so you would pray. How many of you are praying? It's not enough. How many will pray? Come on, we will pray. You pray and agree. All right. Don't get sidetracked. Would you say it with me? Don't get sidetracked. Express your vision. He says to Elijah, I want a double portion. What are you believing God for to be fulfilled in 2021? He was believing for the double portion. What are you believing for? What are you believing for, pastor? Building to be done, move in, thousands of people, plant churches all over the world, open Anchorage. Come on, open other churches as God leads us and gives us leaders. Come on, life group leaders and a multiplication of power and anointing, a great revival. I'm believing for many things, and then I've got my own personal list. Express your vision. Everybody say that. Express your vision. And keep in mind that fulfillment of the dream of vision is conditional. You'll notice in 2 Kings 10, he says, so you've asked, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 10, so you've asked a hard thing nevertheless. Listen closely now. If you, if you see me, I made you emphasize it. I read it with emphasis. If you see me, when I'm taken, everybody say if. If you see me when I'm taken, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. The fulfillment of vision, the fulfillment that God wants to bring in 2021 is dependent also upon your obedience. Now you can't do God's stuff. He won't do what you can do. You do your part, God does his. So many people want God just to come and do everything. That's not even a biblical model. He he co-labors with us. We're we're called by the Apostle Paul as yoke fellows together serving. It's a picture of partnership. But if you don't do your part, how will you actually expect God's just going to come and just blow your mind and bless you? You want your marriage healed, but you don't learn to be Christ-like and you act like a jerk and stay on video games like three quarters of the day. I'm not looking at anybody. I'm looking just at the camera right now. You're addicted to pornography. You're a glutton. 
you're abusive, you won't go to counseling, and you, you actually think you're going to make it in your marriage. You, you really think so? You won't. Now, if you do those things and you pray, God can heal you. God can restore you. God can set you free from your addiction. God can use you. But if you, if you, if you yield and you don't do your part, you're going, oh, God's not helping me. What did that one brother say? He asked the Lord, God, I can't quit cigarettes. I can't quit cigarettes, Lord. And the Lord said, well, I'm trying to help you, but you keep putting them in your mouth. Imagine that. Trying to help you, but you keep putting it in your mouth. It's conditional. Walk in vision. Everybody say walk in vision. He takes the, the mantle and he puts faith to it. He releases that mantle and it goes hither and thither. That's King James. This way and that. New King James. He asked for a double portion. He struck the river. You've got to walk in vision. You've got to walk in the dreams. You've got to declare it. You've got to speak it. You've got to take steps of faith. You must take steps. What if it doesn't happen? What if it does? Somebody, I don't know. I'm filled with doubt. Doubt your doubts and get moving. And some of the incredible things I've seen take place happen when it's totally, it's like it. We got that property. I'm just telling you, we, 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 the offer was accepted and then we had to get financing. And they just told us flat out, you can't get any more. We already told you. There is no financing available. So I got the call back, talking to Dr. Morocco. says, yeah, we can't get any financing. I'm like, oh, that's insane. How could that be? He's like, oh, you just pray. Uh-huh. I went back to that property and I stood there and I said, you said that you were giving this back to us. So this is seemingly closed. God, deal with it. You, it's not my idea. I don't even like the property that much. There's too much work to do. I want Sears or something. I want an easier way. But you said, I was minding my own business. My son made me come here. It's your idea. So God, come on. They were going to call us at the end of that week. That week came and went. Next week now, that came and went. I felt like I was fighting every devil in hell. I'd stand on that property and say, money comes. Ah, I'm looking for the million dollars in the offering. Get the stewardship report. How do we do this week? Oh, good, Pastor. Oh, great. No million dollar offering though. Over and over and over. Third week comes. I'm going out there speaking like a crazy man. They call us and they said, you know, we changed our mind. I said, you know you did. That's right. You know you changed your mind. You didn't change your mind. God changed your mind. That's right. now, I didn't say that. I was like, yes. Every step all along the way with this building and with everything else God tells you to do, with every vision God tells you, you're going to run into problems. They're really challenges. They're springboards to promote you. I don't like that. Yeah, well, there's a battle. You're going to walk in vision. All right. God's speaking to us very clearly as I close this message here. Character is the key to fulfillment. Character is the mental and moral qualities distinctive to an individual. That's character. Character. I should say godly character. You should probably put that in front of the character. Godly character. Because if you don't have godly character, then God can't build on you. You get away, you say, well, I don't know. God's been blessing me and I just, do, I just do whatever I want. Well, that fig tree that didn't yield forth fruit, the owner said, well, just dig around it and fertilize it. Wait a year and see what happens. You're, some of you, you're years up. You, you all know that? Some, listen, you think you can get away with stuff? You're wrong. Because it's only God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And you might be thinking you're getting away with it right now. But actually what's happening is it's wrapping a chain around your ankles. And you've been bound. And it's like a runner trying to run a race, but his ankles are chained. You think, well, nothing's really happening bad yet. You don't even know what's happening. You've been swimming in sewage and everybody can smell you but you. you got to develop character. Without character, you'll never fulfill vision. I'm just going to tell you something. 
Carl Lentz of Hillsong. You know who that is? Horrible failure. It's hammered Hillsong in a significant way, all the way back to Australia, all kinds of difficulties. Hillsong is one of the leading churches around the world. You've heard some of their music. Amazing. It's amazing. And the damage that one man can do. Now, I, I'm not blaming him. He's a man, and the devil's a bad devil. He destroyed Hillsong, New York, and all kinds of people. And if you listen to how that happened, I've, I've begun the autopsy along with Pastor Josh and some of our friends, just taking a look. How is it that you have one of the strongest churches in America doing all that they're doing? How is it that you forfeit all of that and destroy lives? How does that happen? You know why? Because I'm not going to have it happen. I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. Character. What you do in the dark is the level of maturity that you have. What you do and no one can find you, no one will know, no one will see you, that is the level of maturity. Look it straight in the face and acknowledge it and realize without character, you're never gonna see fulfillment of dream. And you'll, we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I'm preaching better than you're amen right now. Ah, hallelujah. What are you willing to do to fulfill your dream for your vision, the passion? What are you willing to do? I don't want to do anything. Well, let me know how that works for you. You're going to have to do something. You have to believe. You have to take steps of faith. You've got to pray. You've got to do your part. What are you willing to do? Some of you need to go get an education. So you need to go get a degree. Some of you, some of you I don't maybe get some training. Some of you maybe join KSM. Or be faithful in morning prayer. God's calling you to do something. And if you'll take steps of faith, he will then fulfill the dream and vision. It doesn't, listen, you're not here alive, breathing right now so you can have a life of suffering and pain and dejection and rejection and, and, and just wave the white flag and hope that he just comes and rescues you. Oh God, oh. We go out of this place in victory. That's how we're supposed to go. With power and authority. And the twinkling of an eye. What are you willing to do as a church? What is it that we desire? Well, that's easy. A historic move of God. I have come here with my wife 15, almost 15 years ago now. I didn't come for a job. I'm not here for a job. God called me to the state of Alaska. And he called us together to build a great church. I don't mean a building, I mean people. We need the building, it's just a tool. To build a great church where your sons and daughters would come from afar. That the power of God would be put on display in the midst of a crooked and a depraved generation. We would hold the word of truth out and shine like stars in the firmament. That God would pour his spirit through you, through me, through us in prayer. And, and that through prayer, that incense would rise, Malachi 1 and 11, from the rising of the sun to the place of its going down, the name of the Lord will be made great among the Gentiles. Incense would rise from this place that God would receive. God would receive his redemptive plan and purpose from the great state of Alaska and beyond. We will take other states. We will take other, we will plant in other nations, in Amsterdam and Holland. We will plant in Europe. We will plant in France. We will plant Everywhere God tells us to do it, we will do it. Come on, reach your hands out, north, south, east, and west. Won't you stand up? Come on, stand up. Come on, we're going to see souls saved. Reach your hands out, north, south, east, west. God, we extend our hands at the close of this service now. And we call in sons from afar, daughters from the ends of the earth, Isaiah 43, your children who you've created for your glory. Bring them in, God. Bring them in. Fulfill dreams fulfilled dreams fulfilled dreams vision fulfilled in 2021 come on say that say our vision our vision will be fulfilled in 2021 if you believe that say amen thanks for listening to this message today if the holy spirit is speaking to you and you realize that you need jesus as your savior and you'd like to pray with me to either commit your life to jesus for the first time or rededicate your life to the Lord, repeat this prayer after me. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. 
Jesus, thank you for dying for me and bringing me forgiveness. I'm sorry for my sins. I repent of them today, and I ask you to cleanse me and wash me of all my sin. I commit to live for you all the rest of the days of my life. And I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, would you text the word SAVED to 907-357-2065? We'd like to send you some information and some materials that will help you in your Christian walk. God bless.